Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Pillay is busy at the moment. He's busy with the ECMO case, a 10-year-old boy with a bad pneumonia that he had to rush to theater. So he's just asked me to start the meeting, and he'll join us probably the next 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm going to start off by presenting a patient that I just saw now. We'll be able to focus on this in any way. Got it. So how do we get it on the screen then? Is it possible? No. You don't have a desktop situation. No. So anyway, it's uh, a 30 year old lady who's one week post cesarean section, who was an elective cesarean section at 38 weeks. Why cesarean section is because she had a previous cesarean section three years prior. So this morning she woke up and she suddenly was short of breath. Uh, she had to rush outside because she wasn't getting enough air. And that's when her husband rushed her to the gynecologist. The gynecologist assessed her as being in respiratory distress and admitted her to the maternity ward. Unfortunately, she's breastfeeding as well. So we had to admit the baby as well. So I saw her about half an hour ago and she was in respiratory distress with a respiratory rate of about 35 per minute. She had bilateral crepitations. She had allowed P2. There was no signs of respiratory failure. So I was concerned about a few things. Number one is, did she have a pulmonary embolus? Number two, did she have postpartum cardiomyopathy and she was in pulmonary edema now? Or the third possibility was, did she have a pneumonia? So I ordered an urgent chest X-ray and some bloods and I was trying to focus on the chest X-ray, uh, but the chest X-ray showed to me what looks like infiltrates more on the right lung, a bit on the left lower zone as well, and a bit of splaying of the trachea, which I was a bit concerned about as well. So did some bloods and gave her a stat dose of Clexane, uh, gave her a stat dose of Lasix, started some nips and did the bloods. Also did a throat swab for a full vital panel as well. And uh, bloods came back within half an hour with results of a D-dimer of 14. Um, I don't have the pro-BNP back. The CRP was 79. I don't have the PCT back. The hemoglobin was fine. The white cell count was 14. So with a loud P2 with the D-dimer of 14, the lady one week post the section, I was concerned that this was a pulmonary embolus and that we were sitting with possible, uh, yeah, possible a, a massive pulmonary embolus. So I called for an urgent CT pulmonary angiogram and an echocardiogram. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone has any suggestions? Did I do the right thing? Okay. Would you have done anything different? I wouldn't have done anything different, particularly if someone is postpartum and all of a sudden he had the sudden onset of chest pain and the shortness of breath and is, um, and is in distress. So you, you need to think about the PE because he's still in the hyperacoly level status, you know, in a postpartum. And also, of course, you've covered with antibiotics, so cover even if there is an element of infection, you've covered with antibiotics. But the, but the most important thing that needs to be ruled out here is PE, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I looked at the x-ray and I thought infection initially, you know, looking at its distribution yeah. of infiltrates. Yeah. But what was against infection is why do you wake up? Yeah. It's Perfectly it's well, you yeah. wake up and you yeah. you get short of breath. Yeah. Uh, so, Trish, anything you would have done differently? No. Yuvi, I'm just presenting the patient that I referred to you to do an yeah. echocardiogram, and uh, Jerome is busy with the neck home assistant, he's on his way down. So, uh, yeah, so Yuvi Governor did our uh, echocardiogram. It started briefly, echocardiogram. Oh, which one? Yeah. Okay, it was fine. My primary heart attention, the area of heart is mildly dilated. Uh, yeah. 
That's fine. So, so we then, pre yeah, so we got our CT palmy angiogram result back. You showed them the chest X-ray? Yeah, that's what I was showing them. Yeah, start with the chest X-ray. You told them that they post. Yeah, the whole story. Because also that chest X-ray there and bronchogram there, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so, um, it's more to diffuse some, some nodularity also with this X-ray, but also with them, and was it a supine or, or erect? That's erect. She went down. She went down. But also, I don't know, the color was a bit also. Mm. And uh, she's HIV negative, right? Huh? HIV negative. She had HIV tests and negative to things. Yeah. Pink had no evidence of DVT and all that. No. I... D-dime is 14. But D-dime is 14. UN is a normal. UN is normal. I know the D might be elevated in pregnancy, but 14, 14 that's, that's, that's very high. You know, I, I wouldn't just say contribute to pregnancy that I, I would still, you know, you know, go CT for CT imaging. Yeah. I so still you, did, did you get a CTPA? It's done already. Yes. <laughs> also, I don't know, but it's day eight. Day eight post pattern. Post season. I don't know how long does it take the coronic embryo and you know, you know, you know, you know. You know, you know, you know. She just presented it. No, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. But that should be an acute. Yeah. It's almost it intra, intra op that you. Yeah. So CT palmy angiogram was done. Uh, just gonna try and pull out the result. Sorry? You said when you I gave her a step dose of uh, Clexane. Yeah. I gave her a step dose of uh, Lasix, uh, Augmentin, IV Augmentin, nebulized her. Yeah. That's a sitting like 98, don't be honest. Dude. 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 Yeah, she's okay. So, I mean, yeah, there's this 10 year old with. You put your stuff on so they. <laughs> oh, oh. And if you just go into it more, so it's fine now. So. 10 year old with what? Uh, MVA, uh, yes. subdural, subarachnoids on the 25th. Now, contusions with a VAP. Oh. High CO2s with a head injury. So. So we can forgive him for. <laughs> <laughs> But he looks, uh, he looks okay, so. Okay, that's good. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, you know, he's 10 years old. We have to, have to do. Do you have any finish your uh, case and name our parents? I just want to give the CT as a CT, that's a CT. Should run the experience, You know, with that X-ray, the first man to say this is the morning. I think you have give me two iPads because despite me starting at 100%, at about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, it's dead. I heard you were using maternity iPad and I said, what? You know, you should give me that iPad. <laughs> Shall I go over here and your response? <laughs> no, I'm halfway through. <laughs> okay. um, what do you think about the X-ray? This right side of these lesions, uh, you know, it's suspicious. Infection definitely. But it's one day, like acute history, day, one week postpartum, mm. post cesarean section, uh, and uh, DDM are 14. Acute. But a scan. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, multi segmental occlusion. Uh, so, but if you just look at this without looking at the other side, it could be cannonball lesion. Mm. That's yeah, it's not too loud. Yeah, it's a confusing action. So but there's confluence. Let's yeah. start. So, no pulmonary arterial filling defects to suggest pulmonary thromboembolic disease. Main pulmonary trunk is not dilated. No right ventricular dilatation suggests right heart strain. Small precardial infusion, which weighs up to one centimeter in depth, anterior to the right ventricle. Heart and blood vessels otherwise normal. 
extensive confluent mixed ground glass and consolidation involving most of the right lung, the prominent sparing of the subpleural lung. There's similar involvement of the left lower lobe, with only patchy areas of left upper lobe involvement. Small dependent right pleural effusion, 9 millimeters. So they say uh, no evidence of the uh, findings are non specific, and foremost consideration is multi lobe infective changes. Differential diagnosis includes non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That's less likely, it's very asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did speak to Matthew, but he did say, he did see both bilateral at moment. What worries me about this, but maybe because I'm a bit biased, is it's not a typical infective pattern. It's almost like they were shot in there and you've got infective focuses. So you need to look for infective endocarditis. And look so at the heart. Look at, yeah. I was worried about the steps. Yeah, yeah. When I looked at that heart yeah. I was worried about steps. So the first question to David was, I asked yeah. him upstairs. What antibiotic would you put this patient in? I'd make sure they're staff covered. Sorry? Broad I'm spectrum. Yeah, it's not Anything else would but... It's fine till your blood counts yeah. and sputum or whatever. I think I'd like that. I'll put on Tamiflu as well. Tamiflu, uh, augmented. But whatever you did till the time I saw her, she looked much better than us. Yeah, what she responded to there, she responded to the Lasix problem. I don't know. Because I gave because her a piece of Lasix cake like, saver. Oh, she's she's but the nurse was higher than Lasix. And now you have Lasix, you know. Yeah, so I did a full final panel, funky tail, blood culture. Yes. But she's an immunocompetent person. Oh, okay. Fit. So pregnant, final, what's happened? Elective yeah. Caesar because she had a Caesar in the first place. But the Caesar site is, is fine. It was it. soft, absolutely soft. No central lines with the PFO and. <laughs> nothing. nothing. I, I, I looked. Yeah, nothing. And there's no vegetation in the heart. Yeah. The valves are all clean. CRP, PCT, 1790 or so. Yeah. PCT, I'm using But it's just what's the acute history. Mm -hmm. She was perfectly well at all. And no, no uh, right heart strain at all. She had mild pumping, but not mm -hmm. really. But the, 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 the raised D-dimers, the D-dimers, big ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, normal renal pumping. Sure. You see some hectic patients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, yes. yeah. 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 so um, yeah, so sorry for the late uh, delay, uh, uh, the delay thing. So the Journal Club, the idea is once a month to have a knowledge sharing thing. It's very informal. It's not a didactic anything. And thanks to the media guys who, uh, they actually edit these things into bite-sized videos that uh, we can post and share and that, so that the, the, the knowledge and all of that uh, is there and shared and we can go back. And I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice thing to have, especially also with the Zoom link and getting people, I'm not sure how many people are on, but People from Bloemfontein and PE and Cape Town and all of that are also, you know, like listening in. So I think it's it's a nice thing, especially for a region, to say, listen, hey, we're not that bad, you know, we can we can do stuff. Um, so I just want to start with uh, this. So this is a paper. It's 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 a very soft journal club. It's not a high hitting thing, but I think it's very relevant to us. And why it got my attention is because of these round table meetings we've been happening and with the discussion and camaraderie and, um, you know, with everybody's, I'm new to Peter Madsburg and I've been, I've actually quite enjoyed the fact that you can phone somebody. I mean, and it doesn't matter cross speciality. Like today I wrote this kid, I phoned him. <laughs> like, yeah, because you know the guy can give you some advice, that kind of thing. So. So it got me thinking, like a multidisciplinary art team in cardiovascular medicine, we're doing it sort of anyway, but what's the rest of the world looking? And, and this paper popped out in Jack, and it's from January, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and I just want to, uh, I need to go back. 
So the abstract is basically, like I said, it's not a hard-hitting thing, but I think the principles are really interesting and really good for us to reiterate, although we know most of this. So multidisciplinary teams, they've evolved significantly over the last decade, right? Let me just talk quickly about the history and evolution, specifically for cardiac surgery, but this can apply. I think we do it in a much broader spectrum of these uh, roundtable meetings. And then you have to see, okay, so how, how, how is it composed? What's the role in treating patients across a broad spectrum of, of disciplines? And what are the basic tenets for successful operations? And what's the challenges that we can face? And the idea is for, for us, because I think journal clubs should be very practical. We should be saying, hey, how can we get better? What can we do? Who should we get? You know, that kind of thing. So just quickly, this is what the article says. So you can read that and then just, it's, I'm just, you know, the rest of it you won't know. So it does play a central role in the treatment of a broad area of complex diseases. Importantly, there's no widely accepted standard. There's no sort of guidelines of how you set up a team. And I think how we're doing it intuitively is actually the right way. Um, and the key, there are principles that exist for the effective operator if my mouth's not working, operationalization of, uh, of the team, all right? And we have to adapt to a changing labs landscape, okay? And as with most articles, further research is, uh, is needed, you know, to look at uh, these things. So just a brief history. So interestingly, from a cardiac point of view, before the syntax trial, before... Uh, the cardiologist decided, listen, yeah, we had better stents than last year. <laughs> and, and, and we started comparing bypass. And I think it's a fantastic trial, and it evolved. Um, you know, that's when heart teams actually became a thing. And then it evolved uh, since Tabby came. You know, now with Tabby's decision making, all of those things. Um, how you know, it, it required discussion amongst cardiac surgeons, interventional cardiologists, imaging physicians. Because remember, now we're getting patients are older, sicker. Nephrology is so important. Geriatric medicine, some sort of comorbid oncology. Thing. What's interesting is, despite no randomized trials, despite no nothing, all the guidelines, American Heart Association, yet everybody say class one evidence for uh, multidisciplinary teams, especially for valvular heart disease and multivessel coronary artery disease. But in this specific hospital, we want to build a center that does more than just valves and bypass. Okay, so we're looking at cardiovascular medicine, including advanced heart failure, cardiac transplantation, adult congenital heart disease, cardio-oncology, cardio-obstetrics, and cardio-geriatrics. Now, all of those things, if you think about who needs to be involved, we actually got 90% of the people here. So there's no reason why we, as Netcare St. Hands, can't set any of this stuff. It's us. We need to say, okay, we're going to do advanced heart failure. How? And then someone needs to take the lead, and we need to sort it out. So, this slide just goes through a little, a few things saying, I mean, key principles. And like I told you, it's a soft article, but I think it's interesting. We need strong team leaders, right? And the team leader is not the team leader of everything. For example, if a, uh, if a, a, a cardiologist decides that they are not an advanced heart failure cardiologist, then they should be the leader in, you know, for that section. If you have a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon and an oncologist who have a significant interest in the genetic advancements of cardiac oncology, then, you know, we should be able to set that. But there should be some sort of leadership, you know, instead of mutual respect between team members, you know, especially surgeons. We are so reputed to be egotistical, with a few blank words, and hopefully, I think times are changing. 
you know, those days are, are over. I think it's a historical thing. Consistency in workflow, clear, clear roles of team, team members, regular schedule meetings. And if you think about what we're doing here, we're actually doing this. We, we're actually doing this. So uh, I, when I read this, I was actually like, you know, we're actually ahead of the curve on this thing. And, and, and there's just a few things. We need to get the funders involved. We need, you know, with certain things. We need to get management involved. I mean, I hope uh, our manager doesn't uh, mind me saying, but we had a sit down earlier and uh, we've decided cardiac surgery and cardiology need their own lives. And I know it's been an ongoing problem and this and that, and that, but I think we need to reiterate all these things and then we need to do something. Our stuff that we can do and we must do now. All right. So, so just to remind you, there's no widely accepted standard. So we are free to do what we want to do, as long as it's logical. And, and, and I'm glad that, you know, dietitians are here, physios, representatives, physicians, everybody, uh, because if you look at the contemporary roles, right, in, in the multidisciplinary team, it's not a one man show. Uh, I think the days of, you know, the surgeon walking up to a patient and saying, hey, Mr. X, I'm doing a bypass tomorrow, don't worry, be okay. I think those days are gone. I think a lot of bad outcomes came from that. And I think now patients should be in control. They should be part of the decision-making. They should be informed. Their families should be informed. They should be, informed. They should be counseled. Because our, our aim as doctors is not to do procedures, not to give medicines, not to do ops, not to put on trips. Our aim is to get a human being's quality of life to the best it can be for the agent, for their physiology, and then to sustain it. And sometimes we exclude the GPs and the general practice. And so I think we need to start sending those letters back. I think it should be default practice that GPs are part of this. And it, they don't have to be the core team, but there is an extended team. And the extended team, this is by no means comprehensive. I think our, our rehabilitation from physio, our dietitian and stuff, we, we superb. And there is room for improvement. We got to put it together. This is just an example. I'm not going to go read through everything, except just show, point out that the financial support from the hospital administration is also <laughs> an important thing. And it includes soft things like marketing, communication, infrastructure, space management. And this is not coming from us as frustrated doctors. It's coming from the Journal of American Cardiology saying, you know, this is what we need. And I think admin and all of that uh, needs to be supported. So I'm not going to go too much into that. I'm just going to, 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 to uh, show you. So from a, from a cardiac perspective, right, valvular heart disease, myocardial revascularization decision, advanced heart failure, cardiac transplantation, cardio-oncology, cardio-obstetrics, geriatric cardiology. I think when we have these patients, we should actually bring them, just for a decision, to say, okay, this is, not to say, this is what you must do. I don't think it's prescriptive, but I think if we say, hey, this is what I did, or this is what I think, what do you guys think? I think we can only grow. We can only get better. So, Patients of, uh, in need of valve repair or replacement, it must be a multidisciplinary team. Especially the physician taking care of the patient. Uh, you know, what I really like here is that physicians take ownership of the patient. There's lots of places where we'll see the patient once a cardiac surgeon's discharged. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's not a safe way to do it. So I just want to show you an example of I'm not going to go through this, but just an example of what case example. So you've got a 78-year-old frail woman who's diabetic, she has a cane, uh, she's got a non-STEMI, she's injection fraction, she's forgetful, there's like lots of things that are not just cardiology. Now the question is, do we do PCI, do we do cabbage, do we do medical treatment, and how much do we Info that we take from the people for somebody who's 
got dementia. You know, like, what are we achieving if we, you know, so I think we now need to say, instead of us saying, I, you know, Jerron, you know, I can draft dignity. You know, Dr. Governor can stint anything. It, it really shouldn't be about that. It's what are we doing for the future? And that's the idea. And the next one, I mean, you can see it's, um, this guy's got a bicuspid uh, aortic valve, you've got COPD, and he's got an aneurysm. Now, he's 64 years old. Cavi versus surgical. You know, most surgeons are going to be like, he's 64 years old and fixated. Versus, you know, looking at a holistic kind of approach. This is just an example. And the other one is, you know, mitral valves. The landscape for mitral valve is changing rapidly. And I think if we work as a team, we can do amazing thing. But you know, if we work separately, surgeons will always do what the surgeons do, the cardiologists will do what the cardiologists do. Physicians will be like, I'm frustrated with the cardiologists and the surgeon. But I think, and if we share the successes and share the, the good outcomes that we can have by doing this, you know, the, the buying is immense. And, you know, the, for example, you can do the best optimal work, but if you're Dietitian and your physio are not on board. You're not going to, you know, you're going to lose long term. Uh, and you let the best on. But there's only four things really post bypass, 12 weeks past bypass. There's only four things diet, exercise, stress management, and appropriate medication, which have nothing to do with the surgery. <laughs> you know, and I, I think, but that's our actual true outcome. That's the true thing. What's a one year? What's a five year? What's a ten year? I feel like I'm preaching. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's just a very interesting article. I'm quite So like we said, myocardial revascularization. Uh, that's, that's an important thing. I have a personal interest in heart failure research. Uh, in our world, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a hectic area because it's territorial. There's, um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, I can't find the right words, but it's almost like not everybody can do that. But if you look at the resources that we have, you look at the capability, you look at the people, you look at support from hematology, I mean, the other specialities, because you need pharmacology, you need, um, you know, the immunosuppressives to be managed, you need microbiology, you need... There's so much of stuff, but if we come together, I really think, uh, I've been inspired by the round table people that we can do this, and not that we can, we should. Because we have a responsibility to the population around, you know. Okay, so critical care physicians, cardiac surgeons, physical therapists, palliative care specialists, nephrologists, endocrinologists, pulmonologists, social workers, dietitians, transplant, Left ventricular assist device nurses, infectious disease, psychologists. It sounds like a lot, but if you say each of those things, we can all say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that guy, we know that guy. We all, yeah. So I think we need to assemble like the vendors. So heart failure is, special, is, is of special interest, and I'd like to, with everybody, drive it. The role of management in adult congenital heart disease. I think that is something we, we can't, I can't, uh, and I don't think as our practice would do it, but there are people in a province who do do it. So I think uh, just on principle, we must also point out there are certain things, if you a multidisciplinary team, it's not, it's not a bad thing to say this patient should go to further, this patient should go to more, this patient, because we just get better at what we can do. Cardio-oncology, I think it's a fascinating field, and now with the latest genetic research, it's, it's a changing thing, and the more you read about it, the more you feel like you don't know anything. But I'm sure, like, the oncologists and that, if you start having these meetings, it's going to be uh, an amazing thing. Cardio-obstetrics, I mean, a patient like this, and, uh, I mean, the cardiologists know, if somebody with a valvular lesion is not pregnant, 
It's not a walk in the park. Especially if, you know, this person has a acute MI because they've had a spontaneous coronary dissection, they've got valvular heart disease, they've got postpartum cardiomyopathy, all of that. But this multidisciplinary team makes uh, a huge difference. Geriatrics, I think, is different as well. We all kind of just treat geriatrics like they just old young people, but they're actually not. I mean, the, the, the muscle wasting, the physiological changes, the multi-mobilities, the frailty, often dementia, etc. I mean, that, that needs also not to discipline. So, I think I've given enough of a passionate plea to, <laughs> for this, and I think, I think we all buy into it. But then, what is the evidence? Is there any evidence? And despite its routine use, according to this paper, its patient outcomes have been poorly studied. Patient outcomes have been poorly studied. And worldwide, it was not significant patient outcomes report, which then brings me to like looking and saying, hey, why don't we then start just collecting the data? Because we're doing it anyway. And see, do we objectively and subjectively feel that our patient outcomes a bit because of what we're doing. There's a systematic overview of seven RCAs around this, which showed uh, uh, statistically significant reductions in emergency department readmission rates, mortality, and functional decline. And I'm talking about TAVIs, South Australian Tertiary Centre, there were 3,400 patients reported a 20% reduction in five-year risk-adjusted mortality following the implementations of a multidiscipline. So they did it without, and then they did it with. And I spoke to one of the profs from uh, uh, the Free State, an uh, old school man. And he's like, no man, it's because it got better. <laughs> 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 so, so there is that argue, argument. But uh, I think oper uh, making it operational, I think we must gather our team's input feedback. Uh, this is not an egotistical thing. It's, not a, it's just for the patients. We want the best for our patients. And I think uh, if we can establish a workflow, how are we going to do it? And it says in this article, even you can't have meetings all the time. And also in private, you don't get paid for your meetings. That's why I'm grateful that you guys are here because they're getting paid to be here. Yeah. You know, but I think we all have this inside desire to want to help. You, you want to help in public, you want to help. But this is actually a form of helping as well. Uh, um, but it starts off by this corridor saying, hey, you know, they got this patient here. They can say, okay, we'll discuss it after. So there's a lot of prelim work, you know, uh, that's done. And this, this paper's actually identified all those things and outlined them. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think it's important um, that, that, that we know that there is systems that people are looking. Now, challenges, right? What, what are the challenges we face? And I think every hospital, or in our case, group of hospitals, have unique challenges. There's interpersonal challenges, there's logistical challenges, there's financial challenges, there's multiple things. But uh, if we know, that there is no place in the world without challenges, and we know that other people are doing it, then there's nothing wrong with our brain or our ability. We can also do it, you know? And I think the, the first challenge is the patients need to be seen by several specialists, and they need to go multiple diagnostic tests, often as a result of these things which they identify, and it creates a physical, psychological, and financial burden there's also scheduling challenges because not everybody is available all the time to have these small teams. Um, so, yeah, that's when they say, look, logistics is problematic and stuff, but each center can. And I think why this sort of resonated with me is because we do. And um, um, I, think, I think if we can now, from a doctor point of view, I think we all quite prepare and talk from the from the uh, physio and uh, OT and dietitian, everybody's prepared to 
the investors. You've got a lot of eager people. So I think from an administrative point of view, I think we mustn't lose the momentum or anything. Look, I'm new here, but I'm so impressed with how it's been done. So I thought this paper would be an interesting first first challenge or first thing for the for the journal club. So the, the multidisciplinary health team plays a central role in contemporary care and it's continuously changing and you have to adapt or get left behind. That's the final message that comes. And that is my short paper that I wanted to discuss. But I thought, I think more importantly, if we can, because we all know each other, so we'll sort of go around and say, you know, what do we think? Then what do you think? Is it feasible? Is it not feasible? And also, like I have, if you tell me, listen to run, heart failure is not going to work here. I'm not going to be happy, but I'm going to say, okay, let's make it a longer timeline. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Uh, uh, David, what do you think? Yeah, no, firstly, I think it's very similar to what we're doing. But I just want to give you the history of the round table and how it started. I don't think you were around. No. So we had a, I don't know whether Mitesh is on. Can you hear me, Mitesh? But anyway. I can. Yes. <laughs> so um, we're just giving a bit of history of how the round table started. So it was a young girl that uh, most of us know, okay, you know as well, young girl with the egg associated. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Uh, vasculitis, uh, who presented with acute renal failure, rapidly progressive pulmonary mm -hmm. nephritis. Uh, I think Nitya started a uh, on uh, plasmapheresis, and but we realized she was going into heart failure. Mm -hmm. Dialysis was a problem. She was having recurrent, episode, uh, recurrent admissions for being overloaded. And the echocardiogram showed pulmonary hypertension, severe mitral regurgitation and what looked like a myopathic heart. Mm. So it was so hard to get the cardiologist, the cardiothoracic surgeon, the nephrologist, and the physician in one room to discuss this. Because the debate for me was, was it functional mitral regurgitation from the myopathic ventricle, or was it initially the primary problem was mitral regurgitation? So, and that's how we got everyone together. That's how the first round table started. And lo and behold, that girl is doing amazingly well. I think she's almost ready for the renal transplant program. Yes, she's, she's almost ready. Yeah. So I think talking about saving lives and changing the outcome, I think it definitely, that first changed the outcome. The second patient would be UV's uh, aortic valve. Um, yeah, the mitral, yeah. the aortic valve, the yeah, previous aortic valve yeah. replacement, the and mm -hmm. yeah. we valve. faced with a dilemma and to get everyone in one room and to discuss it again, and everyone agree that we try and go to a PET scan, which confirmed more or less effective endocarditis. I mean, it changed the outcome. It was again having many minds together in one room. So, you know, I don't think there's any debate or doubt about it. I can tell you the outcome of my patients, I've seen a lot. Besides us learning, just the outcomes of patients has changed. Uh, as I said, getting a cardiothoracic, a cardiac, a cardiologist, and a physician in a room together is hard. So if we have a dedicated time, and I think it makes it easier. No, great. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm going to say also. Uh, so I agree very much with the multidisciplinary team of things. And again, you must know your limits. So as you said, if you're in heart failure, you stay in heart failure, you get the best outcomes. If you're doing valvular, you stay with valvular, as what's happening in the first world country. They've actually got, in cardiology, in, in, just because here we're general cardiologists, we see everything. We don't know everything. Believe me, we're not the... The, we're not the best of the best in doing. We exactly where you're, we take the advice of our physicians, who gives us advice directed, which we thank you. And we must not forget rehabilitation. Cardiac rehabilitation, a lot of people actually side out it. 
But if a patient's had an acute EMI and you do a cat or whatever, you've committed that patient to treatment. But it's not just medical. It's a lifestyle, right? Because otherwise that patient is going to come back, go on to heart failure, whatever, you know. It's then, that's why I always emphasize cardiac rehabilitation. And again, I, I agree with you. If you're in heart failure, it's, it's ideal in an ideal world. Yeah. But it's just because we in general cardiology, but again, we wouldn't hesitate to form a Mopar, wouldn't form to refer the patient onwards if you stuck with the problem. Right. So also know your limits as well. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. Know your limits, speak to people, work in a multidisciplinary team, involve your cardiac rehabilitation team, get the best outcomes. I agree with you, 100%. And I think as time goes, if we have that degree of support, what happens is people then have the freedom to actually find their niche. If we don't have that support and we're not collaborating in that, it becomes difficult because you doing everything, kind of, you know, so I think that's in a way valid, you know, those ways. So, um, anything else? Oh, and don't forget the general practitioners, the people out oh, there yeah. that refer yeah. the patients. Again, you're keeping them informed, because, again, you have a patient who's post-cardiac surgery. The first part of call, if he has some sternal sepsis or okay, yes. here you have accessibility, they'll come here, they'll phone up Dr. Pillay, you know what, I've got some some redness around. Mm -hmm. But the majority of patients go first to the GP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's very important because I remember, you know, um, one of our prof in Devon used to say, you know, even if you transplanted your patient, that patient still respects his or her GP more than you. Mm -hmm. And when he's got a flu, he's not going to come to you. But he's going to go straight to the, to the GP. So, he was emphasizing the fact that once you've done something, just write a detailed letter. And sometimes just put the drugs that are contraindication and onto this patient so that the GP is aware that, okay, you cannot use this antibiotic to this patient in case the patient rejects and all that, maybe give some antibiotic, you know. So it, 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 it plays a huge role in that. And also at the point MTT, um, it plays a huge role. It's sort of helping each and every individual who's involved in that patient, that sense of ownership that I'm responsible for this patient. This patient does not belong to a cardiologist, it doesn't belong to a physician, doesn't belong does to not belong. It's, we're just here to make sure that, yeah. you know, and, you know um, everything, um, you, know, you, know, you know, works well for this patient, including the, 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 the therapeutics and the, 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 that are getting involved. It's also helped that, you know, um, I will not, uh, I remember one day, um, I usually talk one of my uh, patients about the uh, anal diet and all that. And one patient put me in a corner and asked me, Doc, what do you have with this anal diet? And <laughs> I could see that I was, you know, you know, I was very superficial. Send me a diet. Don't worry, the cardiologists are also very superficial. <laughs> so, so it helped that thing of uh, you know, having everyone involved in that patient because you don't know everything as you may as well say, um, you know. We need to know our limitations and, you know, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah. I agree with you. Especially the GP part. Yeah. You have to, yeah. you have to close the loop. Yeah. Right. You have to. Anyone who's online wants to say anything? Where's the note? It's me, James. Oh, James. <laughs> Because I always have something to say if you if you know me long enough, I guess. <laughs> so um, I believe that um, this MTT provides a platform for besides the involved physicians, surgeons, dietitians, it actually provides a platform for other physicians to contribute because a lot of time in 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 the MTT meeting, a lot of ideas arisen from different physicians, although they're not part and parcel of the process, but then they're part of the team. So I think the team effort is crucial for everyone to contribute. And sometimes, yes, maybe they will be in terms of a difference in opinion, but I think we need to rise above it. And I think you mentioned a very crucial point is that constant communication is absolutely important because it doesn't mean that I have operated on her patient and that's mine. 
it's actually our patient and timelessly you kind of need to give feedback to the physician to the cardiologist what we are doing even the patient coming for uh, a repeated admission for other reason for surgical complications and i think that can only keep us strong as a team and that's what i believe thanks well, thanks so much Jain, speech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jain and I often talk about all of this, you know, and uh, I think we share the same, the same sort of view. And I think collaboration is so important. Um, is Dr. Miraj online? No. He's not on. No. Okay, he's probably busy. Um, Dr. Mugabe. Well, call out everybody I sent the invite. <laughs> All right, no. Yeah, Dr. Shane is, I sent it to him as well, but they're busy. So, look, I think, I think it's, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. I just want to say, reiterate, I think what we're doing is great. We must just carry on, yeah. develop, develop, and be inclusive. And, uh, and, and I think the region, uh, we have the ingredients for the best cake in but we just must make sure we bake the best cake and we do, do all the right things. And I'm going to close on that note and just let you know, Carla, my wife, baked some cheesecake. <laughs> and it's here. So you must please have some before you do. Thanks very much. For